there's all this drumbeat for war and, and all these financial benefits that will come if only we could take over that sweet, sweet Canadian land. But we don't want to pay taxes for it, right? So, so immediately we get to, to <laughs> debt finance military efforts here. Um, and then even Albert Gallatin, who simply talks about the need for tax increases to pay for it, he is accused of chilling the war spirit uh, by just, just simply for simply saying, hey, look, we're going to have to pay for this one way or another. Uh, uh, can you just touch about a little bit about this dynamic as well? Like we, we now see the Republicans kind of going full bore, getting not only on exp expansionist dreams, but, you know, we, we're going to build up war debt to, in order to do it. Yeah, absolutely. So one of the issues in, in, in the buildup to the war was that the war hawks and the, the invisibles wanted war, but they didn't want to pay it. So, of course, no one wanted to raise taxes. Another issue you got to you got to realize here that's important is that 1812 is a presidential election year. So Madison's up for reelection as well as some senators and, of course, all of the House of Representatives. So if you're the party in power, you, you never want to raise taxes before an election. You'd rather just defer. And Gallatin, in one way, he, he's trying to delay the war or discourage it. He's trying to support tax increases because he knows that it'll be so unpopular. People won't want the taxes, so they won't want the war. So he's trying to actually put the costs up front and make them visible, which I think is a sort of an ingenious plan. But the, the, the Republicans are having nothing of it. And it's basically just agreed that, OK, um, we will raise some tariffs later on. OK, and uh, we're just going to borrow money for this. Right. And so instead, it's just all right, just push the cost uh, onto later generations. Right. And so they they they, they borrow a tremendous amount. They, the federal government borrows a lot. And similar to the war, uh, the, the, the Revolutionary War, who actually buys these right. bonds? It's 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 not always the, the patriotic American. Um, the, the, the real mover and shakers are the wealthy financiers, right? Because they're the ones fronting the capital. They're taking on a tremendous amount of risk, risk which they're hoping the government will subsequently get rid of, as we'll talk about. So John Jacob Astor and Stephen Gerard, these two prominent um, uh, financiers in the Republican Party, they subscribe to about like a $10 million loan. This uh, loan is they, they get it, it, it sort of a, the, 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 the bonds were risky. They were using depreciated banknotes to pay for it. So they're they're they're, get, they're buying the, basically junk bonds because the government, the United States government is having a hard time selling their securities because the war is not doing good. And of course, what they're going to hope for is they're going to push for another central bank which will increase the price of their debt, right? If, that secu if those the securities are made exchangeable for bank stock. So we'll probably get into that later. But it just shows you, again, the, the once you embark upon this war, that you have to ally yourself with sort of crony interests, right? This happens in the American Revolutionary War, happens in the War of 1812. And as we'll talk about later, it happens in the Mexican War. And this, of course, leads to various privileges. It's benefiting elites. Uh, and so on, and in, 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 in the the debt financing of of the, of the War of 1812 is is, is no different.